Picture a curious five-year-old holding a set of crayons. She weaves a tale to her playmates about how eating these crayons turned her eyes into two distinct colors. That girl was Karen Eber, and with that simple, imaginative story, she stumbled upon the evocative power of narratives. That story, it changed the trajectory of my life. For Karen, this was more than just a childhood memory. It was the genesis of her lifelong devotion to storytelling. I spent 20 years working in corporate America and companies like GE and Deloitte. Karen has harnessed stories to not only inform, but to profoundly reshape the landscapes of businesses and the people within them. The reason leaders are hesitant to tell stories is they don't know how. They see a TED speaker give this eloquent story and they think, that's not me. Today, we delve deep into the realm of a master storyteller who's articulated winning playbooks of Fortune 500 companies one story at a time. We have these moments in life that are really hard to navigate, like a toast or a job interview or a eulogy. The most important thing our audiences can do is give us their attention. And so do we want to squander it by talking at them or do we want to bring them into it and give them an experience? I'm Dr. Jessica Kriegel, and this is Culture Leaders, where we decode the magic behind the masters of movements to unleash the power of culture. This is the story of Karen Eber, master of a movement for better storytelling at work. You're listening to a Culture Partners production. Well, Karen, thank you so much for joining us. I am such a huge fan of yours and so excited to chat with you. I just finished reading your book last night and I was enthralled by the stories, shockingly, I guess not shockingly, the entire time. And I feel like a kindred spirit with you because we have a very similar background. I want to dig into the movement that you are the master of. And you are the master of this movement around storytelling. You may also have other things that aren't about your book or related to that that you are super passionate about. We want to get to know you. So the first question that we always begin this podcast with is understanding what is your why? What is your purpose? It is always to help people bring out their best and give them enough runway and the tools and support so they can make that happen. Like in anything I do, that's what I want. To help you figure out your best, let's give you a whole lot of runway so you can do it. Mm, that's So where did that passion come from? How did that develop? I don't have a good understanding of that. Um, it's always been there. I think I was always, even when you're in elementary school and you play games and stuff, like I think I was always trying to do that because I am an introvert and I do definitely notice details that sometimes people don't notice from observing. And so I would notice maybe a talent of someone's that could come forward more or something that I thought they could do. And it was just so fun to see that and pull that forward and try to help amplify them and give them what's needed. And so in anything I do, I want to make sure people have what they need to be successful and I want to give them the space to do so. Well, that's fascinating because so we talk about intentional culture creation and you are a culture consultant amongst other things and one of the core tools that we use to drive intentional culture is storytelling it's one of the top three storytelling feedback and recognition i think are the three most powerful drivers of culture and yeah. you dig in to the storytelling and then you coach executives on how to tell these great stories and you are an expert storyteller and you've broken it down in this book in a way that's really fascinating. So what's the best story you ever heard that you had no involvement in creating that you didn't tell or coach someone around, but that you were the listener for that motivated you? I don't have one specific story, but the attributes of those stories that I'm enthralled with are when I didn't see where it was going, where it starts, and then they take you on a journey and all of a sudden you end in a destination and an idea that you couldn't see at the beginning. You think yeah. you know where the story is headed and then they just build an idea or put a plot twist in that you were like, oh, I did not see that. And wow, is that clever? Like those are my favorites because I'm right there. I want to see what's going to happen. And I am fascinated by the way it's told. Yeah. So the story 
is an experience that people have, right? You had that experience. And then that experience shapes a belief. We shape some understanding or belief about something, that notable idea, whatever it is, that then hopefully will drive action change, right? And you say talk about in your book that data doesn't change behavior, stories do. It's interesting, though, because you are talking about the science of storytelling. I mean, you're using data to convince the reader, so to speak. And I'm also a data scientist that's talking about culture. I'm a keynote speaker, too. So I'm constantly playing with here's the facts and here's the story that will hopefully motivate that. How do you find the balance between because data also does tell a story, right? How do you find the balance of those two things? What I find if you just share data and you don't focus on the context or the story behind it is that you risk people having different interpretations of it. So even a simple bar chart can lead to different assumptions. I've had a bar chart about students in a university that were required to complete four papers in a semester. And with one month left to go, 23 students had finished their four papers and 300 something hadn't even started them. And so you have the simple four part bar chart and you show it to people and you say, why do you think this is? And general reaction is procrastination. They're students in university. But when you start to dig into it, it turned out that there was a high, um, highest enrollment ever on the campus. And so some students were balancing working and being a student and were trying to, to manage the juggles and weren't procrastinating, but hadn't had enough time to get there. Um, some were being really selective about when they were doing it and what they were doing. And, and so through conversation, we learned it wasn't just procrastination, but you put up this really simple bar chart. And people are going to make assumptions of like, yeah, it's procrastination. And that starts to show where we make assumptions about data that could be different. And we think we're having a discussion about the same thing, but we're really not because we each have different experiences that inform our assumptions. So when you are telling a story with data, you are making people come to the same starting point and make sure they're having a discussion that makes sense for everyone. When you don't, you're risking different interpretations and not having a same discussion. So it's interesting. You, the biggest insight I got out of your book may be completely shocking to you and not have been an intention of yours whatsoever, but you have resolved a mystery that's existed about me and my relationship actually with my boyfriend for many years. So I'm going to share it with you now and hopefully you'll be excited about that. Okay. So I hate watching movies. I just absolutely cannot stand watching movies. I don't want to watch a movie. I have never been excited about watching a movie. I love binging crappy television, though. So I get into a show like Love Island or something really just garbage, you know, kind of television. And I want to watch that show over and over and over again. And my boyfriend is this connoisseur of great movies. And he's like, why can't you get into it? And you answered the question, which is that Great movies captivate us and engage us and electrify us. And when I watch TV, I watch TV to disconnect and just dissociate from all of the stress of life and go on autopilot, which you state in your book. That's why we love binge watching reruns, because we just go into an autopilot mode, which is what I'm looking for when I watch TV. So you've actually solved this mystery for me, which I'm very excited about. Yeah, it's so a thank you. These are, you are welcome. These are the nights where, and I'm sure listeners experience this too, right? You get to the end of your day and you you think the words like, I don't want to think. Please don't put on something hard. I don't want to think. I just want to sit. I just want to veg out because our brain is maxed out. It is saying it is time to save some calories. We cannot afford to spend anymore. Uh, your days are probably very full with complicated things and you're putting a lot of energy towards it. And so being able to just have a lower energy spend and, and save some calories is amazing. Whereas it sounds like your significant other is like, no, let's do some hard thinking here. <laughs> Entertain <Yeah>. me. <laughs> His exactly. days are different, I'm sure. Yeah. yeah, they are. He literally has four hours a day to like meditate and do yoga. Meanwhile, <laughs> I am running a thousand miles a minute and I just want to stop running in my head at the end of the day. Yeah. So the science of storytelling, there it is. That's how it plays out in real life. Okay. So 
One thing that I really loved in your book was you told a story. I'm going to put you on the spot if that's okay about sure. working with someone. It was at the London Business School. You were doing a keynote. You worked with a girl named Emma and you wanted yeah. to workshop making her story better. So I'm a keynoter. I tell lots of stories. I can always get better. Can we do a little mini workshop right now? I would love that. Okay, do you free have coaching. A story? Yeah. Do you have a story uh, yeah. in mind? Okay, I have what a million your... stories in mind. Okay. Here's Go the one that and... I struggle. I'm going to be vulnerable with you and I guess the audience too and talk about the hardest part about being a keynoter when you keynote about culture transformation is there's that signature story about a company who transformed their culture. And it's not a story about being in a boardroom and the CEO who said this one brilliant thing and then everyone in the room gasped and then suddenly behavior changed. It's, you know, that's a great story too. Yeah. (laughs) Or my closing story is all about this woman who was a receptionist who was kind of crusty and irritated all the time. And she worked there for 30 years and she didn't feel connected to the results of the organization. And once she went through our workshop, she realized that instead of being the receptionist, she could be the director of first impressions. And suddenly her whole persona changed because she felt ownership of the results. And it's a great story. And I tell it great. And it's because it's this one person who has a transformative moment. And you watch this crusty lady turn into this joyous, bubbly director of first impressions who's taking accountability for the results of the organization, even though she's simply the receptionist, which is how she had perceived herself this whole time. Okay. But the story that I struggle with telling effectively is the big one in the middle about Oracle's transformation from being an on-prem company to a cloud company by leveraging the power of culture. And they hired this guy who was the head of culture. And it's this big, broad story about applying our model of culture transformation and the results that they got. But I can't get it to feel wowy enough. So can we work on that one? Yeah. And I just, I'm going to keep pausing and dissecting to, to share like, cause we're probably not going to get it far enough in the conversation. Um, it is very common as you're working on stories where you feel exactly what you said of like, ah, oh, I know this is the story. I just haven't quite figured out which way to do this. So it feels more wowy. So very common doesn't mean it's bad. It just means we get to play. So let's play set the stage for the story. Okay. And I will also acknowledge before I tell the story that you have these checklists in your book that says, here's how you do to find stories, which by the way, I have a note on my phone now where I'm collecting stories. And then here's how to select them and here's how to structure them. And here's how to think about the audience, et cetera, et cetera. That's like a million questions, Karen. Like that's going to take me, you know, two months. It's exhausting. So I'm conscious that we only have a few minutes here and we're going to just... Just touch briefly on some of your best practices, but yeah, thank we're you. We're not going to okay. go through all of them. Yeah. So culture transformation is about intentionally creating experiences that drive people to hold certain beliefs. And then those beliefs are going to allow them to proactively take action. And that's going to get results. Culture is the way you think and act to get results. And no one understood this more clearly than Sean Price. I was working at Oracle. This was in 2013. Oracle was an on-prem company, not a cloud company. And Sean Price was hired to take Oracle to the future and to become a cloud company. He was the head of cloud. I was his organizational development consultant. I was so excited because this was super high profile guy coming into super high profile job and I got to be his consultant. And this leader, unlike so many other leaders that I'd ever worked with before, understood that culture was the only way he was going to drive results. Most leaders at Oracle at that time were all about operationalize, execution, go, 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 drive, drive, drive. And this guy said, we need to shift the way we think if we're going to become a cloud company. So the first three days of his employment at Oracle were spent with me and one of my colleagues in the organizational development team crafting, messaging the story of what our culture needed to look like in order to become a cloud company. At the time, only 5% of Oracle's revenue came from cloud, and we wanted it to be 70%. And I don't know how much you know about what an on-prem company versus a cloud company operates like, but it's a completely different customer. It's a completely different... I mean, you were, you were in the tech world, so you must know a lot about this. But for the listener, 
the, uh, the way the operating model is different, the customer is different, the product is different, the development of the product is different, the sale is different, the legal is different, right? I mean, everything is different, so the whole company needs to transform. So we started by identifying a purpose, and he wanted there to be a certain acknowledgement, transparency, and humility around the purpose statement to put voice to the fact that we are not there right now. So he, his purpose was to create a cloud company with non-cloud DNA. And that was, Oracle at the time was just not a, did not have cloud in the DNA. Then he created a strategic plan, which had three different elements that were the big bets that we had to take. And then he created meaningful, measurable, and memorable results that we could measure our success on achieving those strategic plans. And then he identified the way that we have to think and act to get results. And that was the beliefs that he wanted to instill because he understood that people had to think differently in order for them to act differently. And the way he wanted to instill that kind of thinking was through the power of storytelling and recognition and feedback. And he got really explicit about what he was going to, the experiences he was going to create for the team in order to instill these new beliefs. And so he would talk about terrifying things, things that most leaders at that company at the time were not willing to talk about. And one of them was he stood in front of the room of consultants. These were the implementation people, a massive organization. And he <laughs> said in front of thousands of people, your job is not going to exist in two years at this company. I mean, Chaos ensued, right? Everyone is feeling panic in that room because he's basically said, your job is about to become obsolete. And then he turns it around and says, but what will exist is a customer success manager, someone who is focused not on how to get this product implemented, but someone who's focused on how to make sure our customer wins. And you can either get on board with that new purpose and that new mission, or you can leave the organization, basically, which was kind of the culture of Oracle at the time. Blah, 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 bunch of stuff happens. Cut to this last year, Oracle now has 70% of its revenue coming from cloud, and they had the best year ever, $50 billion. The blah, 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 bunch of stuff happens feels like 10,000 stories I could tell about how this behemoth of an organization transformed. And I don't know how to tell a story about 140,000 people. So there's where I get lost. So that's what I need help with. Can you help me? <laughs> I can. I think there's little things that are going to make a difference. And so it's almost like you're looking through a camera lens and now you're just playing with the aperture to bring it into the focus that you want. Um the thing that struck me as I listened is that for an audience in a keynote that isn't a part of Oracle and didn't live it, it's very easy to say, oh, not me. Ah, uh, whatever. I, I don't have to do that, right? And so what you want to do is paint the stakes in a way that they are going to connect to it and they can't avoid to um, to look away. And so... You might even start with something like him saying, your job is going to go away. What you want to do is connect the, what would happen if they didn't do anything? Because yes, making a shift into different markets, different, different customers is important, but the urgency, you know, all the, the pieces that we do when we're navigating change, you want to help the audience feel that. Mm. And so it could be as simple as, um, saying things like, you, you know, those projects where you realize your job won't be there in a year unless this, or have you ever been in a, I wouldn't necessarily ask questions, but where you're, you're helping them think of these moments where you are in these projects or these situations where if something isn't done, there's going to be really significant impacts to the business, to your team, to the people around you. You want the audience to feel that. And when they feel that, the blah, 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 and all this other stuff will be easier because now they realize the urgency and why this had to happen as opposed to, oh, this is another corporate initiative and these people did things and that's great. It's the pulling the audience in so they care and they feel it. That's probably the biggest shift you can make in the story, which could be starting with Sean standing in front of a group and saying, your job won't be here in a year. Can you imagine walking into a meeting where you were told this, that is exactly what happened. 
And then like starting to unpack it that way. What do you think about that? I love that. There's a part in your book where you talk about structuring the story and the order and that there's the chronological order. And there's also, you kind of end with the bang order. And I don't remember how you talked about that, but that's so brilliant. What a much more powerful way to capture the audience's attention, right? Well, and and let me um, flip it for you because I was in a very similar situation, a business that was moving from manufacturing and physical-based um, work to cloud-based. And the CEO, <laughs> um, every annual meeting was coming in with 50 McKinsey slides of the opportunity and the market and what could happen <laughs> and why, what this would mean. And the second time I worked with them, I'm like, these are the same 50 slides you put up last year. Like, are you saying it louder for the people in the back? You don't need (laughs) the same slides. This isn't working. And we actually ended up telling a story that had nothing to do with the company or the situation. Uh, Is it okay if I share the story? Uh, Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So uh, this person, you know, when we got on the call, happened to be talking about his son, who is a really talented surfer. He can surf waves that are just way over his head. He's not afraid of anything and would take on everything with ease, just had this natural talent, barely wiped out. Um, He was a talented swimmer, too. When he would go into swim competitions, he would jump in the pool and would be out when the other kids were halfway across the pool and he was talking to his son and said, you know, are you even trying? And his son said, no, like I, what's the point? I, I'm, I just jump in, I swim and I'm done. What's the point of trying? And he told his son, you know, someday other people are going to catch up to you. You should try. You should really try to exert yourself and get better. So we start here. We start telling the story of his son because he was comfortable with it and it was going to be a good parallel And he's describing this of how he's this gifted surfer and swimmer. And he decided that he wanted to take up skateboarding. Thought it would be great cross training in the winter when he couldn't go surfing. And he goes to the skateboard park and he gets on his skateboard and he's terrible. Could not stay up. Was a mess falling everywhere. And for the first time in his life, nothing came with ease. He had to stop and really listen to his instructors. And he had to be challenged and he had to be pushed and do all these things that felt uncomfortable and new. But he had to do it. And so we took the story about his son and told this about how he wasn't going to be able to be complacent. He couldn't rely on the things he was used to doing. If he really wanted to try to do something different, he had to do these things. And we tell this story and we use this as the opening story. And then he transitions into why they need to move to new markets, why they need to embrace the cloud technology, why they can't keep doing what they're doing. And I got a text from him that night. They're all at dinner. And the text said, it went so good. People came up to me at dinner and said, once a surfer, always a surfer, let's skate. Oh, cool. And I share that because sometimes it's not even the story about the situation at hand. Sometimes you're telling a completely different story that lands the idea that you can then connect into what is happening. And so there might even be a situation where you're telling a slightly different story or you may think of something else and then you pivot into what Oracle did and what the parallels are because that could also work well too. Sometimes stories about a different topic are easier to immerse ourselves into because we're not having the objections of like, that was would never be true in my organization and we didn't do this or that but you were just in the story and then the takeaway comes and you were like I didn't see that coming she got me <laughs> <laughs> that's so great so uh, one of the things you talk about you have a, a very successful keynoting career you've been doing this for a long time and the longer you practice storytelling the easier it gets the less maybe cumbersome the process can become I've also been keynoting for, you know, almost 10 years now, and I I don't think I've ever given the same keynote twice. Every single time I'm improving it in some ways. And right now, if I were to look back even a year ago to the keynote I was giving a year ago, I, I would be horribly embarrassed, right? And it's always true that a year ago today, I would be horribly embarrassed of redoing that keynote. There's also been times where, and I, most of the time I get good feedback, sometimes I've gotten just the most worst, horrible feedback, specifically about the stories I've told. And interestingly, it was when I went personal. When I've really tried to open up at a vulnerable level, sometimes there are audiences that just don't respond to that. 
and you wrote, there's a line in your book where you say, sometimes being vulnerable feels like it could be saying, me, 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 look at me, right? And we don't want to go there, but trust me, you know, it, it's, I agree that mostly it's, it's helpful to go there. But I've had the experience where someone said, she's talking about herself too much. That was too personal. And you talk about the distinction between private and personal, which I really appre appreciate. You know, personal doesn't mean private. You can keep what's private, private. Uh, it took me about a month to recover from getting that negative feedback. Has that happened to you where you've told a story that just bombs or you've gotten just this? How do you recover from that moment? This is now you being my therapist. Like yeah. being vulnerable like everybody, is scary. Everybody. I get in the fetal position and I suck my thumb and you like <laughs> rock back and forth. And you're like, it'll be okay. It's really hard. It is really, you know, I, I think people don't always recognize even when we post on social media or we get on stage or, you know, everyone has their own form of vulnerability that is really hard. And it stings when someone says, not for me. What I try to do before I ever give a keynote is ground myself in who am I okay disappointing? Because in any keynote, there's a bell curve and there's going to be people in the room that fit outside that bell curve that they're not quite right for it. And so I, I share this story in the book about this young man I was working with who was getting ready to do a keynote. He was really fidgety, couldn't settle down. I asked him, what's going on with you? And he said, I'm just really afraid they're not going to like what I have to say. We were in the UK. He was British. And I said, if you were going to have me to your home for dinner, what would you make? And he said, easy, bangers and mash. I'm like, great. If we took this room of 200 people, how many of them in here do you think would like your bangers and mash? And he's like, I don't know, like not everyone. I said, right, because some might think that it's too salty or not salty enough or they're vegetarian. Like you're not going to have all 200 people in this room wanting to eat the meal you make. How do you feel about that? He's like, that's okay. It's different preferences. I'm like, same thing. If you can embrace that idea of not everyone's going to eat the meal that you make and that's okay. If you can get yourself into that going in, that helps. It is hard when people come back, especially when you're telling a personal story and they make a comment. The first thing I try to do is say like, were they in my core bell curve or not? If they weren't, that's okay. It's okay you didn't like it. I'm okay disappointing you. If they were, then I want to understand, did I do something in the delivery that should be different next time? Or am I really helping them tap into something that's bothering them? You know, sometimes when we're sharing a personal story, it is evoking something in the individuals that is really about them and not about you. And so the pre-work and getting clear on your audience and what is it that you're really trying to have them do and who is in that and who isn't is so key because then you can kind of make peace with it of I tried because sometimes the air conditioning in the room is bad or people are hungry or they didn't sleep or they're having a tough time or maybe your story poke them right in the culture that they are sensitive about and so you're getting their genuine reaction and sometimes your story doesn't work and that's okay too. I, <laughs> I always say, you know, comedians tell jokes all the time that don't work and we don't come home repeating all of those jokes of like, oh, can you believe they said that? No, we tell the ones they do and we don't even remember the ones they don't. So the best thing is just be kind to yourself and move through it. You know, especially with keynotes, I find for me anyway, there's all of these great neurochemicals that have you going on stage and then you come off stage and you're slowly resetting. And that is also so vulnerable. Yeah. So when we're coaching leaders around how to intentionally craft culture and we say, create an experience for people, which can look like a story that drives a certain cultural beliefs you want to uh, cultural belief you want to nurture and then that will hopefully lead to some behavioral action or change that then results in something happening for the business that is an outcome that we're trying to drive towards i've seen people react with skepticism about this idea that that could be kind of manipulative right you're trying to wait you're trying to change the the beliefs i hold and you have a whole chapter about that in the back of your book, which I was, mm -hmm. I didn't read the table of contents, but I just dove in. And I was thinking this the whole time, wondering, yeah, but what about if they feel like they're being manipulated by the leader because they've spent all this time and energy crafting the perfect story, right? And then they feel like it's not authentic and you address it so beautifully. Can you speak to that a little bit? Because it's something I hear about a lot. The first is recognizing anytime we communicate, we have an intended outcome. 
And to say that just because you, you have an outcome or something that you would love for people to, to know, think, feel, or do after is manipulating isn't quite fair because I think most business communications have something that, you know, even if that is just to be informed, but to avoid manipulating, you always have to lead with intent and transparency. If it is clear why I'm talking to you, why I'm sharing, you know, here's what I know, here's what I don't know, then you are leading as clearly as you can and laying it all out there. Where manipulation comes in is when people feel like you are intentionally withholding information to form a narrative. And people sniff that out. And once they feel that, that is it. And so we have all experienced maybe a journalist or a politician or someone in our lives where we feel like "Mm, there's something not quite right about what they're saying. And it skews how you see them. So in business settings, when we are driving change, when we are shaping culture, Treat people like adults. If there's something like a return to office policy decision, communicate that. Don't try to put a story on that because it will feel completely disingenuous. Everyone will see through it and they will have no respect for you. Communicate those updates, those decisions. Use the stories for how you are shifting strategy, how you are navigating change, how you are using it in a coachable moment. But when it is a decision and something, you know, I, I cringe anytime a leader says like, what story should I tell that for the fact that no one is going to get a raise this year? I'm like, you shouldn't. You should just communicate that and be as clear and transparent as you can. That's great. So are you the storytelling person or are you this evolving leadership consultant support culture transformation expert that is going to wow the world in some other new way next year what's the next tedx talk or the next you know book i mean what else do you have in your little bag over there (laughs) well thank you for asking that because i have been pushed into the storytelling person and i've walked into it um but for me i've always really tried to focus on how am i building leaders teams and culture one story at a time it's not storytelling for storytelling's sake it's storytelling for creating workplaces where people can thrive or creating leaders that can extend their reach and so Um, I don't think I will ever be just storytelling or just leadership. That's a piece of it. But certainly as I'm promoting the book, it's really leaning into storytelling and and through the context of leadership. And that's my runway for the foreseeable future. Okay, beautiful. Just so you know, everyone that's listening, there's also a part of the book where she tells you how to write the perfect eulogy and the perfect wedding toast. I loved that because it wasn't actually about corporate and yet you were applying the same tools and man, I wish I had read those before the last eulogy I gave her the last wedding toast because they were so brilliant. I got chills from the imaginary eulogy I was imagining might exist from the tips that you gave, you know, I mean, it was really the great eulogy, tips. Yeah. I, you know, when I was writing this, I, this book is, is I think first looked at as a business book, but the best feedback I've gotten is, um, you know, I thought this was going to be a business book and it wasn't. There are of course many business examples in there, but it's meant to help anyone that wants to be a storyteller. And I felt like we have these moments in life that are really hard to navigate like a toast or a job interview or a eulogy. And while I certainly wouldn't expect anyone to buy the book on how to give a eulogy, I want them to remember this is on their shelf in that moment so they can have a way to step through something that can feel really incredibly hard or for a wedding toast where you feel the weight of how do I honor these people or a graduation toast? Like, how do I do this? It's meant to guide you through that. Yeah. The whole book is a guide. I mean, it really is. I mean, it's filled with stories, but it takes you through here's step one, step two, step three, and creating the perfect story, the circumstances where you would do that, things to think about. You've created multiple frameworks to break it down in a really simple way. And I mean, for me as a keynoter, I tell stories all the time. It's super helpful, but we coach all of our clients that storytelling is the driver of culture. It's one of the core tools. And so if you are a leader of a team, of any level, right? I mean, you could be a frontline manager of a team of three people. Storytelling is one of your greatest tools in driving intentional culture to get results. So we're super aligned on that. I mean, I even wonder, did you ever work with partners in leadership when you were a GE? I did not, no. Oh, okay. I was like, I wonder if she did work because we are now culture partners. We rebanded since then. But I'm like, I wonder because it's just so aligned our, our work is. So 
Anyway, I ate it up. I love everything that you do. So we have reached out to some people who have questions for you. Some of these are your fans. They're callers in. I don't know what they're going to ask, so we're just going to take it from here and leverage your expertise while we want to see you in action. So um, let's go to our first caller. Hi, my name is Karen Hilton. I am president, CEO, and chief vision caster for TAP Executive Coaching and Rock Your Vision. I'm based just outside of Atlanta in a little town called Woodstock, one of the top places to live in the country. My specialty is executive coaching, HR consulting, and organizational development. My question is for Karen Eber, your guest today. I work often with um, leaders from large organizations, founders, and folks who are accustomed to succeeding and doing well at what they do. What they're also used to doing is getting stuck in the weeds. And one of the things that I'm passionate about is the concept of vision in leadership. And as I work with these leaders, one of the most challenging aspects of my work is convincing those same leaders who are really good at what they do that storytelling can be a really effective part of casting a vision. My belief is that vision is the power play for 21st century leaders, but it's often a hard sell. So what advice do you have for those leaders who believe that they're not storytellers, they're just fill in the blank? Uh, So fun. Hi, Karen. (laughs) (laughs) You know, very common leaders natural idol is just going and sharing information and it can feel like more work to tell a story i love to start with a question of do you want to be talked at or do you want to have an experience because that's what audiences go through you can talk at someone with a vision and lay it out or you can tell it in a way that they are alongside you experiencing it and feeling like they are a part of it i think the reason leaders are hesitant to tell stories is they don't know how they see a ted speaker give this eloquent story and they think that's not me but they don't recognize there are steps to get there And the most important thing our audiences can do is give us their attention. And so do we want to squander it by talking at them or do we want to bring them into it and give them an experience? That's where I like to start because once they understand and agree, yes, no, let's, let's have them be a part of this and experience this. You can then take them through the steps to tell a story. Oh, that's beautiful. I mean, we talk about the action trap, which is. Most leaders get stuck in this, okay, we want to achieve X result, you know, $200 million in sales. Great. Let's take a bunch of action to make that result happen. We're going to hire salespeople. Do we make $200 million? Not yet. Okay. How about we train everyone on a better sales process? Do we make $200 million yet? Nope. Let's go back to an action. Let's, uh, you know, do a bunch of uh, technology implementation, get a new CRM, you know, maybe that'll get, we'll do a new marketing campaign. And all of that is action focused on a result that is feels like the rat race of chasing business. You know, if you really want to transform people's behaviors at work, you need to get at the mindset, the beliefs that they hold. And we do that by creating intentional experiences and storytelling is the most powerful tool to do that. So I love what you said about it's really you're saying, do you want to talk at them, which is just more action trap? Or do you want to engage with them in a way that gets it that them being proactive about taking the action you need them to take instead of having to constantly micromanage the activity, right? I heard a great quote the other day from Dr. Lisa Feldman Barrett, who's a neuroscientist. She said, emotions are the recipe for action. And if you want to tap into emotions, you need to start with stories. Mm, beautiful. Okay, let's take another question from a caller. These are fun, aren't they? They are fun. <laughs> yeah, I like them It's like, too. who's who? <laughs> who's, what's next? I don't ever know either, so it's cool for me too. Hi there. I am Jaylene E. Murphy. I am on the prairies in Canada, although today it snowed, so maybe we are runners up for the North Pole. Not too sure. Anyway, I wrote a book called Modern Day Courage, and we'll be asking questions about the heart and uh, how to use your heart for storytelling. Thank you so much. Oh, great. I mean, this is what we were just talking about. So go on. What is the question? If either of you want to answer this question, I'm curious about your thoughts. 
in my book, I wrote six, six short stories and it's about 44 pages. And I was told that um, I have a way of putting thoughts and feelings into words. I'm just wondering if there is a way or do you think there's a way to use the heart to put actions, um, words into obviously a story and then to get action from that. So again, using your heart to put a story together and then to, to get action out of that. I'm just wondering if you have any information or any ways to get that done. I would just be curious. I know Karen, you talk a lot about, about data, but I'm just wondering if there was anything that you had on the heart in regards to making a stronger story. Thank you so much. Absolutely. It does build on what we were just touching about of emotions mm -hmm. are the recipe for action. What you want to be thinking of at the onset is what is that feeling or experience you want to give the audience? And I find there's two places that are particularly helpful to think about as a starting point. So in the book, I talk about these five factory settings of the brain, which is how our brain is going to respond to information or communication. And the last two get to a little bit of experience. So one is, are you trying to help the people listening to the story feel like a member of an in-group, meaning, you know, in-groups are groups where we share values and experiences or even aspirations, things we want to be a part of. In sales, this is the, I'll have what she's having. Out groups are where we notice our differences, that we aren't a part of something. Um, charities use this where you hear the story of someone impacted by a natural disaster and they don't have electricity or food and, and you're listening to this while you're in electricity and food and you recognize how different your circumstances are. So when you're telling a story, you have these choices of, am I trying to make the audience feel like a member of the in-group, like feel a belonging in this idea that I'm saying, or am I trying to make them feel different? So with organizational change, you want to often tell stories of an outgroup of why we have to make the shift. So if we look at Oracle, like why they needed to make the shift to be cloud-based and why they couldn't stay where they were. You want to make people feel like this member of an outgroup of like, yeah, we can't stay here. That does make sense. We do need to go. We do need to make these, these changes. Um, that is a really interesting place to start because it really gets to this feeling of belonging and acceptance and where do I feel like I fit in, which is, of course, right at the heart of emotions. The, the last factory setting is that we seek pleasure and we avoid pain where we've got all of these neurochemicals that um, our pleasure neurochemicals are are our dopamine, our serotonin, our oxytocin, which are released in these moments of connection and they are bonding. Uh, the The uncomfortable ones, the pain ones are your uh, norepinephrine, adrenaline, and um, cortisol. And those are released when we need to focus and potentially get out of danger. So when we're telling stories, these neurochemicals are released depending on the story and how we are interacting with it. And you want to be thoughtful of, are you telling a feel-good story? Are you telling this story about this incredible experience? Like you could tell that Oracle story in a really feel good way of how people went through this change, or you could tell it in an uncomfortable way of why they couldn't stay where they were and how do they navigate through this discomfort or both. And so I feel like even playing with both of those things of what is that experience that you're trying to give and how you move people through it can start to pull people into the experience of the story Every story has heart because you do want to take people to a different place, whether that's through knowledge, whether that's through a decision or action or something they feel and leaning into that is key. Such powerful words. And I'm fascinated because I've done a lot of research on Henry Tajfell and in-group out-group dynamics. And I've never heard about the power of the out-group. It's always been we need to make people feel like they're in the in-group and the out-group is bad. That's othering. In-group is belonging. And I've been doing a lot of research lately on how to create large-scale change of beliefs. And there's a lot of data out there around cults and how cults leverage the power of group 
in group dynamics to yeah. get people to transform their personal beliefs. When you feel belonging as part of a larger group, that becomes sacred. It becomes part of the survival mechanism of the brain that the group will save us. And social death is almost worse than physical death. And so when the beliefs of the group are attacked, and you can see this in political polarization, right? Republicans and liberal Democrats, if someone in the group or outside of the group attacks your personal belief, you see this inflamed emotion from people, whatever side it is, because they feel like the group is getting attacked. And therefore, that psychological identity that has become part of our own identity feels like it's getting attacked. It feels like a personal attack. And I get in fights with my boyfriend all the time about things like fem feminism, for example. We have not necessarily the same views on that all the time. And I feel like he's attacking me with his beliefs, you know, because the in-group of female has become part of my identity. And you are talking about using the power of the outgroup to get someone to want to belong to something that they don't. Yeah. How Even, do you do that without inflaming yeah. that fear? So think of a job interview. In a job interview, you want to commute, if you're the candidate, you want to communicate you're a member of an in-group of a culture addition. So you bring knowledge and experience and things that fit in really nicely to the team and the company, and they can easily see you being a part of it. You match their values, and you are adding to it in a way that feels like you are complimenting. But you also want to demonstrate you're a member of an out group because you are coming with different experience. You are coming with different knowledge. You are bringing things that don't exist. And you want to do that in a way that they recognize this is a compliment and not a competition. So mm. you don't want just a, a, you know, I hate the term culture fit because then we're probably just building more of the exact same, which isn't the goal as you are hiring. You want to show where you were similar, but you also want to show where you were different, but how that different benefits them. And it's the same thing when you're using out group to move people to a different spot, you're showing why it's different, but what the benefits of that difference is and what that could look like to get there. Well, I just have to dig into one thing that you said, since you're a culture consultant too. We hate culture fit at Culture Partners. That whole idea, I mean, it just allows for unconscious bias to seep into the hiring process. And when people think culture fit, they're thinking someone I'd want to get a beer with. And most of the time that person looks and talks just like you and has the same background. I mean, all my friends are 40 year old women that are, you know, in my same socioeconomic status. I mean, that's just my world because we yeah. look for those similarities, right? And that's not how we want to make a decision about who we hired. We, we encourage companies to hire for purpose fit. What is your personal purpose and how can it be fulfilled by helping us accomplish this organizational purpose? Does Eber Consulting, or Eber Leadership Group, right? Is that the mm -hmm. name of your company? Yeah. Does Eber, Eber Leadership Group have a purpose statement or a mission outlined yet? Uh, yes, I just don't remember it at the moment. It's oh my goodness, it's terrible. <laughs> it's been a long day. I, I've it got has book tour brain day. going on. I, I do. It's a variation of building the building the people centric leaders, teams, and cultures, creating healthy um, workplaces where people can thrive. But I don't have the succinct wording of it. But yeah, okay, we started well, there. Work on that for next podcast, huh? For sure. <laughs> okay, guilty, awesome. guilty, guilty, guilty. <laughs> so. Here's the last question that I always love to ask people is what is one question that you haven't gotten asked on your book tour and these podcasts and the interviews that you do that you really wish someone would ask you so that you can answer it? When is storytelling hard for me? Mm. I think people think that, you know, you're a storyteller, you do this. I still struggle. You know, I wrote half of that book for myself and the things that I struggle with. Um, I am an introvert that does my best thinking when I've had time to process. And so there are times where I'm doing a workshop with a team and I have to like work on a story on the fly. And so the same questions and concerns that everyone has of how do I tell a story in the moment? How do I tell a story that doesn't ramble? How do I get the right ideas? Like those are, are things that, that I work through too, because I've done it a lot. They've gotten easier, but 
when I am tired, it's very hard to get all of those things in place that, that are really leveraging the factory settings of the brain. And so I will have moments where I'm like, gosh, I'm just seeing the most boring generic thing ever. How do I change that? How do I step back and think and kick things into gear? And so I share that because I struggle with the same things and it's about setting the right things in place, giving myself time to work on the story and edit and come back to it and know when it's not right, even if I don't have the solution so I can then come back later. Well, and that's interesting because like you said, you didn't drive into the storytelling career. You kind of walked into it. You had a TED talk. It went viral. People came knocking on your door saying, do you want to write a book about this? You had ideas and off you go now being the expert at storytelling. And really your expertise was steeped in so much more than that beforehand. Do you feel pressure now to always tell great stories to because you're the, the expert? I mean, is it harder now because you're the expert? I'll tell you what makes me nervous is, you know, as a part of keynote, you're often asked to join a dinner or a meet and greet or something. And then when you accept, they're like, oh, you're a storyteller. This is going to be amazing. I'm like, hold on. I'm an introvert too. Like, I don't want to be working the whole room. And like, I'm an introvert that isn't the center of attention, which is very funny because I've chosen a career where it's keynotes. But for me, keynotes are very much about bringing ideas to scale and giving people the information they need to be successful. So, um, I, it, it is always like a, the same thing I think everyone feels. Am I going to be able to come up with that story in the moment? I um, have spent my career in these places where I was a chief learning officer, a head of culture, and, and always trying to persuade people that had budget to make these investments where one person had the ability to say yes and 90 could say no. And so that's where my storytelling chops came from of how do I use the stories to get people on board and slow the no from all of those people that could stop things that didn't have the approval to say yes. So in some shape or form, that's what I rely on. I've I've always been telling stories in the moment to try to connect people to ideas. And I usually get there. And when I don't, I admit like I'm I'm coming up short on a story right now. Um, let's see what comes to mind for you and, and it ends up being okay. Well, that's a beautiful way to end it. Thank you for your own vulnerability and sharing this conversation with me and allowing me to put you on the spot, get some free coaching from the Karen Eber. That's fantastic for me. I'm going to implement that in my next keynote next week right away. I'm going to start the Sean Price story with this leader stood in front of a room full of 2,000 people and said, in two years, your job won't exist here. Mic drop, pause, turn. You have all of these body language and tonality and pause suggestions in your book as well on how to deliver a great keynote and deliver a great story in person. So I'm going to take all those tips and make them mine. Take that yeah, one step further when you say that, then take it to the audience and say, like, can you imagine being told that? Can you imagine what that would feel like? You know, anytime you are talking to them as you and having them put their head into that, it gives them the moment to invite them into it. So say it for sure. And then make sure they really feel it before you then go into it. Cause then it'll be like, Oh yeah, that's scary. What do you do? That's the emotion part of it, right? Yeah. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for your time. It was an absolute pleasure. I'm such a fan. Everyone should absolutely get your book. Tell us, is there, where can people learn more about you, about your business, or just get more information about you, the ma- amazing future things that you will be doing for the world. My website is the best place. It's my name, K A R E N E B E R dot com. The book's there. There's um, all sorts of different storytelling articles and tools. If you want to dig in and and poke around on being a better storyteller, you can get started today. And I joined your newsletter, Brain Food, right? Yeah. I'm so excited. I can't wait. Wonderful. Thank, Thank you. you so much. It was a pleasure chatting me. with you. Likewise. Thank you for tuning in to Culture Leaders. I'm Dr. Jessica Kriegel, hoping you found inspiration in today's story. If you enjoyed the episode, please leave a review and share your thoughts. And thanks for listening. To connect and learn more about today's guest, visit the link section on this episode's show notes. Please be sure to connect with Jessica and the show at jessicakriegel.com. There, you'll be able to see all the episodes and learn more about transforming culture at your organization. This episode is a Culture Partners production. Until next time, keep shaping a positive culture. Thanks for listening.